Okay, three crazy years. We are living through some pretty mental times at the moment. And every now and then I, I sit there and go, you know, what has actually changed since I was a kid? Like when you, like a lot of the basic things haven't changed. We still go to the shop to buy food. We eat, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. We watch TV. A lot of that sort of stuff hasn't really changed. You know, kids go to school, all that sort of stuff. And I thought, well, you know, starting at 2020, so we had, uh, you know, round numbers. What actually happened over the last 50 odd years? Um, and really, I, I wrote a big old list. I mean, the, the list could be a lot bigger, but I, I thought of the, the biggest things. Uh, and it's really you know, computers, mobiles, internet. A lot of that is very internet based, you know, with, um, you know, VR and AI and all that sort of stuff. But there have been some really big uh, changes in, I guess, human life and quality of life over the last 50 odd years. So obviously, we didn't have that back then, and we have all this right now. But when you're looking at sort of forecasting what, what's going to happen, a lot of the analysts and, I guess, data scientists out there these days, the, the ones that are, you know, uh, trying to predict where things are going, oh, hey, mate. Um, a lot of them, or over the last decade or so, have been of an older ilk. Uh, we're getting a lot more younger scientists coming through. And when you take the Gen X sort of population, the people who are real, or the baby boomers and Gen X who have really gone through this big change, the, yes, there's, you know, tech has progressed a little bit, but when they're trying to extrapolate what may come, you know, what, what's coming over the next 10, 20 years, they always, always massively undershoot. And a lot of, even scientists don't, you know, they forget that we, the law of accelerating returns and they still try and project things on a linear sense. But what really actually happens is we have something like this, and it, it, it is a lot faster than we think. I mean, even this year with you know, the advent of GPT-3 and everything else since then, like, we, are, we really are accelerating. Hey, hey, was it like a minibus full of people? <laughs> Just, welcome. Um, so yeah, things are going, um, I, th I think we've hit a bit of a tipping point, um, which we'll talk about later when we talk uh, um, in the Q&A session about AI, but I, I think things are rapidly accelerating, faster than we can keep up with. And that, re that, that gap there is the exponential growth blind spot. I need my little pointer, sorry. Um, just for the laser, laser, there we go. Oh. I forgot to tell you, Pips, your water is down here. Uh, <laughs> such a, I had to cut up a little cup. Um, right, so yeah. Um, and when I first started doing this slide, the first thing I did is I just went to ChatGPT and went, you know, I just started asking it questions. Um, and just the fact that I can ask a, a bot these days for, for stuff, I, I just find, uh, you know, hilarious. But even life expectancy is, is extending faster than we know. So this is over the last sort of 300 odd years. Uh, the average life expectancy in the UK, because you know, sub-Saharan uh, life expectancy is always a lot uh, lower. But uh, you know, w over 300 odd years, we've you know, tripled it basically. But what I found fascinating is that literally in the last 50 years, our average life expectancy has gone up 10 years. And I think it, with the advent of CRISPR, and lots of other um, med tech coming around, I think we're going to rapidly extend that. And you can then go one step further. If you listen to Ray Kurzweil, the most prolific inventor alive at the moment, who's got such an accurate hit rate, he says that we'll be able to be digitally immortal um, within the next five to 15 years. So his whole li his life goal is to stay alive just long enough so he can become digitally immortal, where you can effectively have a digital copy of yourself on, on the cloud. I mean, that's going to change life insurance and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I also asked, you know, what, what major events happened in humanity from 1970 to 2020? And yeah, there, there was quite a lot. But when you think about the last three years, I think, you know, so much has happened. We're, we're in a state of hyper-normalization, in my opinion, where we are getting so many batshit crazy events and we sort of see it on the news and go, yeah, whatever. We sort of just like shrug it off as, as though it's normal, but it's not normal. 
The last three years have not been normal. So in no particular order, well, technically it is a chronological order, uh, 2020 onwards. So Australia melted and then burn, uh, and burned and then flooded. Prince Harry left the royal family. Oil went to minus $37 a barrel, something which I thought was impossible. Um, I lost 42 grand on that. <laughs> it's annoying because I, I nailed it. I called a massive crash in oil and I shorted oil heavily from $25 down to 10. And for months I said, look, I'm shorting oil. It, when it gets down to $10, I'm going to close my shorts and go mega long. And so I, I made a tidy fortune all the way down. And there's loads of YouTube in interviews of other people where I've, I've said this. And then I remember that day, it was during lockdown, it hit $10 close everything out, I went gig along, and in the space of half an hour, I think, it went from $10 to zero to minus $37. Like, that, that, yeah, that was crazy. So that was a humbling reminder that in the investment world, if there's ever a time where you are 100% sure on something, you've got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Um, and the reason I thought it was impossible that oil couldn't go to minus money, it was because I had a distinct lack of knowledge about, I guess, some of the futures contracts, a part of it, and also the, the physical deliveries. One of the reasons was that, you know, there was nowhere that people could offload the oil from the ships. Um, and so people were paying uh, people to not take delivery. It was just, yeah, it was just crazy. We started to leave the uh, EU. We had um, some sort of pandemic <laughs> lockdowns, which again, that was crazy. I mean, the pandemic, yeah, it was crazy, but the lockdowns, that was unprecedented. Never on a global basis has a very small amount of people gone, everyone needs to just sit in the house for a, few, for a year and a bit and just watch Netflix. The whole world locked down. And as a, as a result, stock markets tumbled. Um, we had stimulus, crazy stimulus over four trillion dollars. That's just the, in the US, that's not globally. Four trillion dollars in the US in, tw in literally a matter of months. Um, interest rates went to zero overnight. They had eight hurricanes <laughs> and the Arctic Sea did not freeze. I, I found that, yeah, it was literally hurricane after hurricane. Um, and this is what we didn't see in the news. Four million people in Asia were left homeless. I think that's a, a way bigger news story than you know interest rates or how, like four million people homeless. That's, that's like half of London becoming homeless. First private orbital space flight. Um, and there's a big difference there. Not little hops to the Kármán line and back down. <laughs> orbital is a completely different level. Um, and then uh, the flu disappeared for a year. And then uh, it's making a stonking return this year or last year. So um, rather interesting. And that's just 2020. 2021, global supply chains froze, obviously. Taliban returned to power. So 20 odd years of military presence in Afghanistan. We then went, yeah, okay, we're going to leave now. And the Taliban just went, huh, cheers. Oh, and thanks for $5 billion worth of weaponry. They, they literally have attack helicopters now. Um, that's no joke. <laughs> so um, NASA landed another rover on Mars. A cargo ship did <laughs> an Austin Powers in the Suez Canal. Um, yeah, and it's quite funny because a few months afterwards, the Evergreen, they ran ashore in, in America, in, in, uh, I think near Mississippi. They literally, yeah, so they blocked another river. Um, is anyone allergic to dogs, by the way? No? Okay, Pips is here, by the way. Um, we're short of childcare today. <laughs> so, um, yeah. She's my, she's my daughter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> GameStop and Doge wrote, wreaked havoc on Wall Street and they, again, humbled some big Wall Street people. However, when you actually look at the, the aftermath of that, everyone treats that like, you know, the, the average retail person screwed over Wall Street. It was the other way around. Who made the real money? Wall Street. Matt hedge funds. There were a few hedge funds that got absolutely obliterated, but every other hedge fund made a fortune out of it. So really, it was just, yeah, they, they sacrificed a few hedge funds, but most actually made billions. Uh, oh, anyone, and the actual owners of GameStop made billions, literally. There was a, a coup, which doesn't happen often, so Myanmar is, uh, is liberated, so, supposedly. Facebook stopped for six hours, so did WhatsApp. 
Um, and we had all sorts of US election bollocks. Um, the 2020 Olympics in 2021. And the jibby jab rolled out on a global scale. And Boris did not have a party. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so moving on to 2022, interest rates started rising at the fastest rate in history. Inflation hit its highest in over 30 years. Russia invades Ukraine. Crazy sanctions, economic sanctions, which we haven't seen since World War II. Um, Finland and Sweden apply to join NATO. And yeah, Turkey ratified the Finland yesterday. I mean, if... Russia got, you know, got angry about the Ukraine cozying up to the West. What do you think they're going to think about Finland, which has a huge border? Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's going to cause problems. Um, according to the Doomsday Clock and all the other, other metrics, apparently we've been the closest to World War III ever. In fact, it's probably even closer now, now that Finland's joining. Former Japanese Prime Minister got assassinated. I mean, this shit doesn't happen anymore, really. The Queen died. Nord Stream 2 sabotage. Again, that's massive. We surpassed 8 billion people. Uh, and we had the biggest crypto bear market ever. Um, not by every metric, but by most metrics, this is the biggest crypto bear market ever, which explains the turnout today. Uh, <laughs> we've had record debt defaulting in history, record debt, history, record debt in history in all sectors. Endless crypto institutions, that's a strong word, institution. Endless crypto ponzies and firms and brokers going bust like FTX. And we recently had uh, the second biggest bank collapse in US history by volume of, of, of money. And then, yeah, we apparently forgot what a ma man and a woman is. I still find that the most hilarious, probably is not the word to use, but that, you know, we go hundreds of thousands of years knowing what a male and female is, and now you're a bigot if you say that. Right, moving on. Um, <coughs> so basically, if you... Um, <laughs> God, I'm going to get so much hate on YouTube. Um, so really, if you started investing over the last three years, which so many people did, think about lockdowns. We're stuck in our house watching Netflix. Loads of people started investing during lockdown, didn't they? Over the last three years, they've seen more shit than most people have seen in 20 years. Um, <clears throat> maybe not 50 years, but definitely the last 20 years. Um, and that's saying something, because we had the two, two, you know, tech bubble pop, the subprime mortgage collapse in 08. Like, we've seen some crazy stuff, but it's not settling down. Um, there is no mean reversion here. I, I think this is hyper-normalization, and yeah, things are just going to keep on getting cra crazier. Now, the next two slides are from the last cuddle. But I have to reiterate them because these are such these are bigger metrics which they need reminding. So this is where I need my pointy pointy. <clears throat> so um, ba, 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 what are we looking at? I've actually forgotten the scale. Oh yeah, the Fed funds rate. The so basically the red stuff here is the, the U.S. interest rates, right? And as I said last cuddle, which is what two months ago. Every time the Fed does a pivot and they drop rates, what happens? We enter a gray zone, which gray on the computer, on the projector, doesn't look that gray. Rates crash, we enter a, a, an economic crash, i.e. stock markets plummet. Rate drop, rate drop. Every single time we've had a sharp pivot, we've had a, an economic recession, right? Which it seems counterintuitive because people think rate drop, oh, they're going to turn the printing presses on, everything goes up. It's not the case. The only caveat to that, please understand, is that if they pause rates, stock markets rise. Nearly every time they've paused rates for a, you know, a quarter or two, stock markets continue rallying. So what, I think over the next couple of months, we could see a potential pivot or a pause. Um, so just be aware, if they pause it, 
that's not that's very bullish it's only if they start dropping as in crashing rates over let's say two quarters then um yeah stocks start tumbling so that's interesting uh, the green line i think is the s p 500 in my opinion it is which is why i really want to hammer this in again so if you look at this um more recently the no let's move on so i've got better charts here one second okay so I, I actually took these a few days ago. So this is the Fed funds rate. So the gray zones are all these economic recessions. Every time they've crashed it, we had you know, some sort of crash. We had a mini one here in um, 2020, but there's more for COVID and lockdown. But what's happened here is probably one of the, f oh no, not probably, the fastest rate rise in history in terms of the rate of increase. Um, <clears throat> and and so this is our leading indicator. Whenever, the whenever we have rising interest rates, as in really fast, that's sort of the setup of an economic recession. But it's not just that. You need to tie it in with a few more things. So next slide is this one. So this one, the red one, is unemployment rates. So if you also look at times where we've had falling unemployment rates, it happens just before an economic recession. It, it makes no sense, but it does. So most of the time, so all these grey zones, we've had really low employment, uh, sorry, unemployment rate, then we have a crash. Really low, in, or as in locally low unemployment, crash. Locally low, crash. Locally low, crash. Another low, crash. Low crash, low crash, low crash. In my opinion, the unemployment rate, we all know it's a load of bollocks, the U6 stats and how they, they fudge the numbers. But when you look at this chart, just go with their official numbers. Whenever we have really low un unemployment rate, that normally, normally precedes a crash. So what's happening right now? We, are, we have literally got the lowest unemployment rate since 1970, pretty much. If we were to draw a straight line, um, yeah, 19, late 1960s is the last time we had this low unemployment rate. So when you combine rising, as in hiking, interest rates and this other leading indicator of, of really low unemployment, what do you think? We, we could, or I think it's highly likely we, we, we see another green, uh, gray zone, as in economic crash. But it's not just that. You can then add in inflation, which is this green line here. It gets a bit all higgledy-piggledy here. But when you have rising inflation and you have all of these other factors, it, it just adds even more probability and propensity that shit's going to get real. So, ev so most of the time, not every time, most of the times, you have rising inflation, low unemployment and rising interest rates, crash. Rising inflation, rising interest rates, low unemployment, crash. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And where are we right now? Um, apparent, well... I find this hard to believe, but um, so there's a lag here. Um, for some reason, the Fed isn't showing current inflation. I, I, I wonder why. Um, I, if, I were to, if I were to, you know, draw a line here, I reckon inflation is, is spiking. Sorry, the lag is from here. You can see that inflation is really picking up there. Can you see that? If we did it to where we are now, I think, it, I mean, just look at the prices of all the stuff that you buy in the shops. Real, in, in, real inflation is still really high. And also, what do most people put their money in? Because remember, inflation is not one thing. It's different for everyone. If you're a uni student with no job, what is inflation for you? It's your internet subscription, pot noodles, and beer, basically. If you're like a family person and you have wife, kids, husband, kids, wh whatever, what are the things that you spend on? It's either a house, car repayments, groceries, all that sort of stuff. So your inflation rate is going to be different than a uni student. If, let's say, you're like myself and you're an investor, what, what are the, where do you put your money? It's, you know, well, not me, an, a typical investor. It's stocks, bonds, commodities, property, all that sort of stuff. What are the prices all of them doing? They're all going up. So inflation in real terms is actually going up. So, rising inflation, low unemployment, hiking interest rates. What do you think is going to happen over the next year or two? Like, I know we are all very cautious of the, of the term um, history doesn't repeat itself. But in my view, it's history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes really damn well. 
normally with a sinister tune. So I, I actually put big money on this, that we are in for a, like, a period of crap. And everyone is thumb and bum, mind in neutral. Uh, you know, everyone, oh, Bitcoin's going up now. Let's get bullish. Uh, or the Fed's going to pivot and start printing. Let's go, go long. I'm, I'm really, really cautious about that. Um, and it is okay to not be in the market. Being in cash is actually a very good <laughs> position sometimes. Um, but if you look at this guy, he says everything is fine. He's literally said the banking system is fine. Um, literally everything is fine. But I think he's more like an ostrich at the moment. Um, he's got his head buried in the sand. Uh, I personally don't actually, actually think he does anything. He has handlers, in my, in my opinion. Um, but here's, here's the interesting thing. Just go back a few years to, say, 2020. What do you think the, the US thought were the biggest threats to the US? Just have a random guess. China? 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 What is it, sorry? Russia. Russia. So you think, so, okay, that's interesting. Oil? Sorry? Oil? No. Well, the US in 2020 thought Donald Trump was the biggest threat to global peace and the US. Um, Russia and China, very low on their sort of radar. If Fox News were to do that again, it would probably most likely be Putin over here, and then et cetera, et cetera. But really, the biggest threat to... But in fact, what would you say is really the biggest threat to the US? Yeah. And who is behind that? Who, who is the... There we go. China, Brazil, the BRICS, basically. Um, I think they're really the, 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 the main threat to the US. Um, so, but right now, if you were to put your you know, finger on the pulse, America isn't really paying attention. They're not, they're not really paying attention to Russia and China properly. The things that they're focusing on right now are superfluous stuff that doesn't, you know, Yes, a bank's gone bust. You know, they've got US elections coming up soon. We had another shooting. There's always a shoot. Um, and again, we have um, definition issues. So, <laughs> so God's sake. Um, so what happened recently was something seismic. That is the biggest bottle of water ever. <laughs> Just hold it up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> so what happened recently is Russia and China had a really, really important powwow together. They got together, had a little chat. Oh, sorry, can you turn the heating off, please, mate? Um, the, yeah, they got together, and what they did was signed 14 different economic agreements. And this is from President Xi Jinping. Um, uh, Xi, I can never say his word, his name, Xi, Xi, Xi. His, he said, we signed a statement on deepening the strategic partnership and bilateral ties which are entering a new era. Discussions were frank, friendly, and rich in results. Um, these two are very similar people, by the way. They're, they're from a personality profile, they're both red. Uh, they both speak, you know, in the same way. So I, I, I can imagine that they do get on pretty well. Uh, again, our two sides must enhance communication and, co and cooperate closely, promoting new and greater advancement in practical co cooperation between our two countries. We were just discussing a good project, the new Power of Siberia 2 pipeline via Mongolia. Practically all the parameters of that agreement have been finalized. That's interesting. That deal has been going on for years. Um, but yeah, recently, th these two are getting more in bed with each other. But it's not just that. Saudi Arabia is also ruffling up the US's feathers. Again, the average Joe on the street in the UK and the US is completely oblivious to all of this. So they're considering accepting yuan instead of dollars uh, for Chinese oil. Well, I think that's almost through now. That, that's almost, almost be, been passed. And that is a major blow to the US petrodollar system. Hands up, it's a safe environment. Who is not fami familiar with the, the petrodollar system? Ah, oh, sweet, you all are. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. Um, <clears throat> well, guess what? They all, China also went in and brokered a deal, uh, or peace agreement, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. 
the Shiite and Sunni Muslims, they are like mortal enemies. But China has just come in and went, right, you two, you're going to be friends now. Um, so China is really flexing their guns on the, the global political scene. And also, yeah, uh, the Saudi-Chinese deal is, as I said, is very, very close. And that will be a huge blow to the petrodollar system. And it's not just that. There are, I mean, they're the main things. It's, you know, Russia and China cozying up, uh, Saudi and China cozying up uh, for, for oil. And there are loads of other smaller things. For example, Kenya is having a dollar crisis. Not just Kenya, there's loads of smaller nations around the world that are having a dollar crisis. And over the next couple of weeks, Kenya could be potentially ditching the dollar. Uh, for the people who work numbers, I am giving you free advice that those of you who are holding dollars, you surely might go into losses. You better, you better uh, do what you must do because uh, this market is going to be different in a couple of weeks. And uh, secondly, uh, we, through the central bank, we are having conversations to reinstate the interbank exchange uh, market that has since uh, not worked. And I am happy that the players in that sector, including our banks, are coming forward and they are participating and uh, they are working with the central bank so that we can again uh, take charge of our market and that it is not allowed to be distorted by uh, brokers. I'm told the only place where brokers are accepted is at the exchange. <laughs> Anywhere else, they are banned. Uh, and so I just want to assure uh, those uh, in Kenya who, uh, who, are, who are facing uh, challenges of access to dollars that we have taken uh, steps to ensure that uh, dollar availability in the next couple of weeks is going to be very different because our fuel companies and, uh, will now be paying for fuel in Kenya shillings they do not have to look for dollars every month because we have uh, done what we must do as government to ensure that we ease the burden on people who want to um, uh, uh, realize their returns in dollars. And uh, I was being told by the chairman of NSC, so Mr. Chairman, you have nothing to worry about. We have taken adequate steps to make sure that uh, that is sorted. So they're going to start... Um using uh, paying with fuel with their own shilling, which is interesting. And this is not the first. Zimbabwe's already ditched the dollar. Well, they haven't ditched the dollar. They are using other currencies as well, like the Chinese yuan, etc. So this is one of many dominoes that are currently falling. We have El Salvador, which has effectively ditched the dollar. We've got Zimbabwe, we've got Kenya. It's happening at an increasingly faster rate. Um, and also Kenya and a lot of Africa is embracing crypto pretty rapidly. And th I mentioned this on the trading pub uh, yesterday. More Kenyans own crypto than Britons do. It's, that absolutely shocked me. 8.5% of Kenyans own crypto. Whereas in the UK, it's only 6.2%. And that's of, that was as of literally yesterday, that result. Um, so as I said in the, oh, two days ago, um, as I said in the trading pub, I'm not sure of volume though. So if you took the 6.2% the of UK that had crypto and add, you know, how many billions is that compared to the 8.5% of Kenyans that have crypto, how many millions or billions? I, I would hazard to guess that the, the Britons have more crypto just because of socioeconomic um, circumstances. But the fact, I mean, that is, you know, I don't know what the percentage uplift there from 6.2 to 8.5 is. That's what, like a 20% uplift off the top of my head, something like that. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, it's interesting. But again, everything is fine. Uh, Biden says, you know, there's nothing to worry about. The US is strong. But if anyone's read anything or listened to anything by Ray Dalio, you'll probably understand that everything is not fine if you are the US, basically. And I would highly recommend digesting pretty much everything Ray Dalio says. Um, and one of the things he's saying is basically, Empires go through cycles, 
um, and they have been for thousands of years. And the US is already on the down curve and we have a rising superpower right now, which is China. Um, China really sort of opened its eyes in sort of 1976. And since then, they've, they've basically just cop. China, they don't really innovate, they copy and they copy very well. So they saw what the US or the British and the US did you know, imperialize, imperialism and what the US did with the, you know, gun uh, diplomacy, so to speak. And so China was like, ah, oh, well, we're, we're better at doing things than others. So we'll just copy what the US and Britain did. And so now they're, they're using checkbook diplomacy. They're just going out around there, doing all of these, you know, dodgy uh, loans with caveats. You know, when I'm talking about the, uh, all the times I've talked about the evolution of war, etc., um, where you know, yeah, we'll build you bridges and stuff like that, but the money never goes to the country, it goes to Chinese contractors, you know. The US have been doing that all over the world. Um, and so, yeah, China owns huge swathes of Africa right now, and increasingly, uh, increasing to do so. So the, the interesting thing, in my opinion, is that if the US can't threaten and bully the world with dollars anymore, because the dollar strength is being undermined. Not, I'm not talking about the dollar index, I'm just talking about the dollar strength as in people's um, using it, as in countries using it, etc. What do they have left to protect economic interests? Because before they could be like, right, we'll, we'll turn you, we'll, we'll take you off the dollar payment network. Network. I mean, if you're like a, if you're a country and you see what America did to Russia recently, with all the sanctions, they stole $600 billion worth of Russian money that was in the in SWIFT network and the dollar payment network and gone yoink. Other countries are going shit. Like if I don't do what Biden tells me to or whatever the US tells me to, they could just donk us on the head or just force us and threaten us. Look, we'll take you off the dollar payment network. We'll put you on the axis of evil register or whatever they w wanna call it. Well, they've only got one thing left that they can use to flex. America. Um, <laughs> and guess what? The only reason they have the biggest military is to enforce the petrodollar system. That is it. That, that, that is it. And again, please watch previous videos where I've talked about the petrodollar system. Um, well, what should you do then? You know, it's all very well going through this doom porn, but what can we do as mere mortals, mere plebs. Well, there are some things that we can do. And I think there are seven things in general that we can do. So I would get off your high horse if you have one. So if you're like me, you know, everyone's very righteous these days and you know, oh, the world is ending, blah, blah, blah. I always like to go back to basics and, you know, control things that you can actually control. Can I control or influence what the US, China, Russia do? Or no, I'm a, I'm no, I'm a nobody. So what can I do? What can you yourselves do for your, for your family? Or well, cash flow is crucial. So just do whatever it takes to increase your cash flow. More cash flow means you have more options, more time, more, uh, more thinking space. So whatever you, you do, whether it's a job or business or whatever, there are, there are numerous things that you can do to increase your cash flow. Um, you know, if you're in a job, think of a, setting up a part-time side hustle, an online side hustle of some sort. If you're in a business, can you expand into your business? Can you have a new product, a new market? Can you buy an existing business? Um, can you, like, there's, no matter which level you are on that wealth generation journey, there's always things that you can do differently uh, or, you know, just to get some extra cash flow. Just go back to the basics. I always control what you can control. There are, there are huge opportunities in front of us um, and you, these opportunities are useless unless you have the capital to pounce on it. So it's all very well, you know, I could be damn right about everything, let's say. Magic wand, I'm right about all my forecasts. Big crash coming, crypto's going down and then up. That's what I still think. Um, blah, blah, blah. I could be right. And by the way, over the last 10 years, there have been so many times I've been spot on about something, but I haven't been able to capitalize on it. And there's nothing more frustrating than going, I told you this was going to happen. And then, you know, your wife or your friends go, oh, how much money did you make from it? Not much. <laughs> it's just, uh, so it's, it's one of my ever chronic things where I'm just looking back in the past going, oh, look, you said this would happen for a whole year and it did. 
and you made like no money from it or very little amount of money from it. So I don't, yeah. So me personally, that's one of the things I, uh, one of my little uh, revelations that, you know, I put more money in your mouth, if that makes sense. Um, the, but in order to do that, you need capital. You need to also be extremely picky on what you deploy on, when you do it and how much of it. So yeah, the what, when, and how much of, of, for your capital. Um, there personally, there've been times where I have deployed too much capital too fast into too many different things. So I'm diluting my money into loads of different things. Um, and so there have been you know, opportunities popping up and I've been skint, I haven't been able to deploy. Uh, also, just by spreading your assets too thin, your you know, wealth, re when you look at those that have become wealthy, they have got wealthy because they, con they, they had a concentration of capital in a certain thing that did well. No one really ever got rich in a time efficient manner by spreading their assets into everything. That just doesn't happen, um, not in a time efficient manner. So if you look at anyone that's gone from not being a millionaire to a millionaire within a 10 year period, they didn't do it by investing in mutual funds. They did it by going all in on something, concentrating their assets on something, or you know, that could be a business that they run, you know, go from one man, one woman band to you know, five person band or whatever. But um, yeah, it's, it, I, I'm a big believer in the concentration of capital. And because of that, you have to be really picky what you choose, when you choose and how much of it. And the other caveat to this it are the, that sort of quadrant um, where you can have small money, small and slow money, and small and fast money. So a small and slow money thing will be investing, you know, five grand, 10 grand into a, a company, which, you know, aims to sell in five or 10 years, right? So what are you, you're, you know, you put your five grand in or whatever, and if that company doesn't do well, you're screwed. And even if it does do well, let's say that company does exactly what you, it says it's gonna do, and it, you know, it sells to Microsoft in five years time, your five grand or whatever, what is that going to turn into? Let's say you double it. Okay, well, you've made 100% over five years. Then when you look at it on a yearly basis, it's like, oh shit, maybe I could have used that money elsewhere. So that's small and slow money. Small and fast money is, you know, doing a business or something. You know, can I buy, you know, big fluffy teddies from China for 10 pounds, or you know, more realistically, for 50 pounds each, um, and then sell them for 80 pounds or 100 pounds on Facebook or something. You know, that's small and faster money. So on the other side of the quadrant, you then have big and slow money. Again, that's like investing a shit ton of money into a business and hoping you can sell out in five or 10 years or whatever. And then you have big, fast money. Now, unfortunately, there's also another graph, which is the risk with all of these things. Um, so yeah, big and fast money will be something like investing in a pre-seed IPO investment, which I've done twice. One of them did really well. That was investing pre-seed in the TMG IPO. We literally doubled our money or more, more than that in like, I don't know, six months. That was pretty good. And then the second time it happened, we put 400 grand into this seed IPO investment. Uh, and again, it, the, the same, same term sheet, it would have been a six month play and that company held our money hostage for five years. And we didn't make the, you know, the ROI and it was basically 400 grand. And then after four years started slowly getting that money back. So that's an example of a big money play, big and slow money play, which went wrong. Um, actually didn't go that wrong. You got the capital back, but really when you look at the five years or whatever it took to get the money back, massive loss of opportunity cost. Um, and yeah, so, so you have to analyze, you know, slow, fast money, small, big money, etc. plus with the what, when, and how much it's, it, it is make or break. Um, and I've made big, big errors um, it, with all of these things in the past. So I'm ever present about this. Con yeah, just it's a chronic thing on my head. Again, don't spread yourself too thin. Um, I think I've already co covered that. Five, it also doesn't hurt to have insurance measures. Okay, so this isn't really a capital appreciating type thing, but this is not just for, you know, crypto stuff. So yeah, for crypto, it's worth having a spare trezor, uh, backing up your data, um, yeah, passwords, the 3-2-1 principle, have more than three instances of your seed phrase. 
stored in two different mediums and, and in more than one place. Okay, so the three to one principle. So that way, you know, if your house burns down, you literally don't lose all your crypto as well. <laughs> so you need at least one form of your phrase, seed phrase, outside of your house. Um, <clears throat> again, food and water. We've seen what lockdowns can do and, and there will be more lockdowns. Well, is it worth getting three to six months worth of food, you know, non-perishable food now, whilst there isn't a panic? I mean, it does not hurt to have, let's say, three months worth of pasta and rice and pesto and other stuff like that. You don't have to go and bulk buy it today, but just fill up your pantry. Or if you don't have a pantry, fill up a box <laughs> and put it in a room somewhere. And don't do what we did, put it in a room in the house which um, wasn't as secure as we thought. And then we had rats eat through six months worth of food. <laughs> and those rats also, okay, yeah, we had a rat or um, another completely, we had somewhere else in the garage and the rats ate through some wiring in Ellie's Tesla. I was like, Jesus Christ, you can't leave a car anywhere these days. Fucking rats. Um, yeah, Coco had a field day. We literally just like put her in the room, shut the door. Uh, um, but she wouldn't catch anything. So we, it was like a, yeah, me, Ellie and the cat trying to corral them. It was actually mice into the corner of the room and then catching it and then like putting them in the woods. I can't kill things. Anyway, so yeah, eyes on where the football is going, not where it is right now. So if you're literally playing football <clears throat> and I don't know someone's got the ball and you're the winger, like, you know, you know, you, you're, you know what's going to happen. The person is going to try and pass it to you, but they're not going to pass it to you where you are right now because you're running, aren't you? The, the, the crosser or the person is going to kick it forwards in front of you. So you need to be focused on, right, I need to get to this spot ASAP. Probably not the best analogy. But how can you apply that principle in, in trading, investing, business? So if it's business, like, um, where is the puck going? You need to embrace AI tools. Like, that's an easy thing. Right. Every type of business, no matter how bricks and mortary your business is, you need to embrace AI and have some sort of AI automation, like at the very least, just to save you man hours. Um, trading and investing, where's that going? Where, where is the puck going? Well, we know the incumbents are screwed. Um, so crypto, I, I guess in being in crypto and staying you know, on that crypto curve, you're already going where the puck is going. Um, what else is there? Business, investing. Yeah, it, it, again, same with investing. Like I've sh I showed you those metrics again. I think that is compelling evidence we're going, going to see an economic recession of some sort in the very near future. That's where the puck's going. So how can you insulate yourself now? Again, a lot of these things like, you know, three months worth of food or whatever will help. And also prepare your red card drills now. So in flying, in aviation, you have, obviously, there's a million different emergencies a plane or a helicopter can have, right? What you don't want to do, and, and there's a section in every pilot operating handbook of your, your red card drills, which is stuff where if it happens, you don't go, let me just get my checklist out. Right, there is a fire, check. Yep, there's a fire. Um, turn your cabin heater off like you, you don't do you literally don't have time you'll suffocate by then or, or, or burn so you know engine fire or fire in the cockpit would be a red card drill engine failure red card drill there are things that you need to be able to do off the top of your head instinctively and then yeah and then other things where you can you know have time to get your your checklist out well you have the same thing in business you have the same thing in trading in investing let's take business it's easy um Right now, you lose your emails and internet. And you know, let's say, yes, yeah, Monday morning, and then boom, you lose internet. So no emails, no automa all your automations go out the window, everything stops working. What do you do? Oh shit, you can't access your, your systems. You, you know, like, what, does your business have red card drills for shit? Power off or internet off? Um, and the same with, with trading, like, are you prepared for a massive devil candle tomorrow? If the S&P 500 drops 20%, what are you gonna do? Um, so have a little think. But yeah, they're my little seven things. And now, Teddy Town.
The real estate trade is Teddy, Teddy, Teddy time. Right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Shush, Snoop. Um, so, right, I think that's break. It should be, ah, oh, 10 minutes early. Okay, it's a little pop quiz question. Who can tell me what a zero knowledge proof is? <laughs> okay, who can tell me what, let's say, an easier question. Who can tell me what does Chapella mean? Come on, you're crypto investors. <laughs> um, who can tell me what date the Shanghai hard fork happens? Boom. Give it to a cousin, a niece, oh or I don't know. 12th of April, yes. Congre congrats. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to talk about zero knowledge proofs uh, later. Chapella is the Shanghai hard fork and the Capella um, uh, upgrade. So they're calling it the Chapella. Um, what other questions did I ask? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, 12, and, the, and the hard fork. So, yeah, what we're going to do is we're slightly early. Oh, first of all, whilst we're here, just because we're 10 minutes early, does anyone have any questions on what we've just covered this morning in terms of, yeah, Luke? Um, <clears throat> so, again, I'm not an expert on Indochina um, sort of relations and stuff, but the way I see things, just my personal take, is that they don't want to get caught up with all these economic sanctions. So they're like, it's like Russia and China are brothers, let's say, and at the moment, the Russian brother is being a bit of a hothead and having a fisty fight with, you know, the cousin of, you know, America, let's say. And this, this brother has spent decades trying to go, rise out of poverty. They're now a respected business person. Um, yeah, they're like a really respect, respected big local business owner. And they don't sort of want to be associated with that because if they, were, if they had those same economic uh, sanctions, it would cause havoc on their, their whole you know, ecosystem, or not ecosystem, their uh, business system uh, systems um, let's say imports exports all that sort of stuff so they are friends or they're, they're relatives let's just say and they're and they um xi jinping is saying look we don't want war they ha they are actively trying to broker some sort of peace deal etc um and that when they met to do all those agreements they did come with um a multi-point sort of peace policy which russia politely declined so yeah, they don't want it. And by giving Russia weapons, it's just, you know, it's like the US giving Ukraine fighter jets, which hasn't happened yet, but it's pretty close. Um, but yeah. Yes. Why is America given weapons instead of money for them to buy weapons? They, because they, it's like a double bubble for the US. So what happens is, you know, let's say I'm the US. And I've got a whole bunch of inventory, which I haven't really used in, in a while. So we can then go and say, hey, Ukraine, do you want some weaponry? Yes, we need weaponry. OK, cool. Well, let's say it's a billion dollars, right? We're going to give you a billion dollars worth of weaponry. That will be treated as a loan, right? So we're going to loan you a, bi a, a billion dollars with some av you know, extra caveats and clauses. So they're on the hook. They get this weaponry. And then they, they reorder that stock from, guess what, US weapons companies. So not only do they have a loan from Ukraine, but they're also, um, with, with those loans, there's probably extra payments where they, you know, they get to resupply their own stuff. So it's not normally in the US, it's more like P Poland, let's say. So they force Poland to give a whole bunch of tanks to the Ukraine. So um, the U Ukraine is now in debt. So again, there's, there's clauses there. But then what does Poland go and do? They give all the tanks over, but they have to go and order more tanks. Who are they going to order the tanks from? The US military industrial complex. So it's sort of a double bubble, double win type thing. Um, but yeah, it's, 
it is increasing this like they've I had a big list of all the things that they've sent to Ukraine. It's it's ma it's massive. Like, like one of the things was something like 300 side like uh, air to air missiles, which you know there's it was a really stupid order because there's not air to air combat. <laughs> it's not both sides. They they refuse. They, I mean, no one has air supremacy because um, what tends to happen is you have air supremacy, so you control the skies and then you send troops in, and then you can do CAPs, so combat air patrols and close air support missions. But, but, but because both sides have really good anti-air weaponry, so S-300s, no one wants to send any planes up. I and mean, what's happening is that the Russians are coming in really low, they're doing lobbing techniques, unguided lobbing, so they get into sort of 40 degrees nose up, release, and fuck off, and so they're literally lobbing ordnance roughly in the, in the general area because they, want, they don't want to get within um, uh, SAM range. And it's the same on both sides. So there's no air-to-air -air fighting, yet the amount of air-to-air -air missiles that this, we are selling, the U Ukraine is just ridiculous. Yeah, it's just the, mili the US military industrial complex are loving this. In, it's in their best interest to keep this war going as long as possible. Yes, Brad. Yes, they're screwed. Um, they had a one-child policy, which now, which really was bad news. So they've got a very top-heavy um, population, so more old people than young people. Old people don't add value to the the economy, and I, and I say that from a purely economic point of view. By the way, I'm not saying you know all, all, all people should just bugger off. They, like old people, by their very different definition, being old provide less economic output than, say, a 20-year-old. That's what I'm, I mean. So what happens from an econ economic perspective, old people are a burden on the system because they, you know, they need pensions, they need more health care, they need younger people to look after the older people. And when you have not many younger people, it's not good for you know, the lo longevity of one's economy. So they, they're now having this three-child policy s uh, system, I think, the last time I checked, or they're... I need to double check. Is it in place right now, the three-child policy in China? I can't remember what I read, but um, they're screwed. But their neighbour, India, they don't have that problem. They have a very big, young um, demographic. So I think, give it 10, 20 years, either one of two things will happen. AI and robots will get so damn good that it doesn't really matter, and that they just build 100 million robots, solves the problem. Or they just hoover up all of the workforce from India. Now, I used to think it would be the Indian play that would happen, but with the, adv with, with the advances of AI and robotics, um, I just, yeah, I don't think it's gonna, the, the top-down demographic thing is gonna be as big an issue. So I remember someone asking me this identical question like three years ago, and I said, yeah, China's just gonna have to pay India shitloads of money for all the workforce. Fast forward to all of the tech d advances now, I I'm less worried. Like, they're, they're already using, like, I watch this stuff all the time, so some of you may not, but just spend an hour researching the most up-to-date AI and robotics. Like, it is crazy. Um, Tesla's going to have its uh, Optimus Prime, the, the, you know, the, the humanoid robot. Um, what's the other one? Is it Future or? Figure. Figure, that's it. Um, fig there's another company that's trying to do exactly the same thing, having a humanoid uh, <coughs> servant-type robot. And China's also doing that as well. So I think one of the studies said that there's, there, there's going to be something like 100 million bipedal humanoid robots over the next 10 years. 100 million? How many people in the UK? 80 million? 70? Or is it 60? 63. 63, shit. Yeah, so imagine basically a country, <laughs> a bigger country than the UK and France, suddenly it was just all robots. So yeah, lots of menial labor type stuff. Oh, and don't forget, China has seven, 70 million construction workers. So China has more construction workers than the UK population combined. So like, yeah. Um, I saw these arachnid robots, uh, arachnid construction robots. Anyone seen them? So China's developing these arachnid, so eight limbed construction robots. Um, it's so, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Sorry? Do they? I missed that. Good film, but yeah. 
Um, I don't know what Avatar is going to do for the volcano people. Are they, the formula is going to be broken, isn't it? <laughs> but, yeah, I won't give it away if you haven't seen it. But um, yeah, so I, I don't think it's much of a problem. Any other? Yes. I think they will, yeah. I mean, if you look at their social credit system, it's already like miles in advance. The World Economic Forum and the UN, they're looking over at China going, wow, you got your population on a leash there. We love that shit. Um, and so I think we're trying to get to where China is now. But, you know, they're, they're so far ahead that I think they're, they're not going to be innovative. I think they're just going to apply things a lot quicker because yeah. we're very slow. Um, <coughs> The West are innovative, but slow to adopt stuff. China are like, we'll, we'll, we'll nick that and we'll just copy it. Quite brutal. Yeah, really brutal. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Like when you listen to Elon and he's saying that, you know, Elon himself, I think, said in AI Day that he'd like something like, um, was it 10 million robots in like literally in a matter of years? Or that's, you know, the first things they're going to take are manual labor type or menial labor type stuff. Um, I mean, warehouses are already, if you look at the Amazon warehouse, there's barely any people there. Um, but it is going to create more jobs as well, because you're going to have a whole new suite of jobs from robot technician to AI supervisor to robot supervisor. You know, just like 10 years ago, a social media marketing manager or well, social media manager didn't exist, really. And now every uni student is a social media marketing manager. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the future, it's gonna, there's going to be loads of different jobs, robot related, robot repair. Um, and I think with all this tech, everyone does get a bit carried away sometimes. I actually think all the, the, the tradesmen's roles, they're going to be booming. I, I genuinely think tradies are sorted for the next, you know, at least 10, 20 years, especially electricians. Electricians, like, if, you're, if you have a son or a daughter or whatever, and you want them to go into, I think, a resilient, um, industry resilient industry, <laughs> elect, elect, become an electrician. Every electrician I know, um, although they run their business in a very archaic manner, they don't have any online stuff, and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm. they are booked out like three months in advance. They make shitloads of money, you know, for one, like I know one electrician, he makes 80 grand a year. And he, you know, like, he's fully booked for as, as long as he wants. Um, yeah, and I think with more robots coming along, if, you're, if you are an electrician, it doesn't take long to, you know, learn how to fix a robot. And then let's say in 20 years time, there's a billion robots on the planet billion server, servant robots, whatever, you're gonna, they're going to need repairing. I mean, Elon wants at least one robot per, per household. So, I mean, how many households are there? Shitloads. So, yeah, just like if you're an electrician right now, it doesn't hurt to be a, learn how to be a solar panel installer or a, a car charging installer. I mean, it's just, it just makes sense, doesn't it? So, but yeah. Um, any last questions before? Yes. Um, why is it that lower, lower unemployment indicates a crash? It shouldn't be the other way around. It should be the other way around. I, I don't understand it, being completely honest. Facebook and Amazon and... Everyone's firing everyone right now. How is it low then? If it's because they, they, they mess around with the stats. I think it's completely bollocks. If you look at all of the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, Tesla, Microsoft, they have fired, I think, now it's something like over 250,000 people in the last nine months. How is unemployment really low? And I think the main reason is because of the way that they treat unemployed people. So if you're a full-time job, you have a full-time job and you get fired, you're not tr treated as unemployed. You're treated as part-time. Because yes, you don't have a job, but you're looking for a job. So you're not quite unemployed yet. Yeah, so there is a bit of a lag. I think there's probably a t six to 12 month lag because I don't think, I think it takes six to 12 months to, to have a person be treated as unemployed. So I think if that person doesn't get a job within three or six months, then they go, they're not unemployed yet. I think they then go to another subcategory, which is part-time not looking for work. I can't remember, but it takes a long time for someone to lose their job and then be class unemployed. There, there, there's definitely a time buffer there. So. 
But yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. You'd think mass unemployment, but I think in real terms that there is mass unemployment. We're just not seeing it. They, they love fudging the numbers. But again, that's just, I could be completely wrong here, but all I'm looking at is the chart and the chart clearly shows you for the last, since the 1960s, when the official rates are very low, we have a crash. Especially when you combine inflation, unemployment, interest rates with all what I said, yeah. So.